on Dr. Phil. She found flirty emails and much more. Glittered lip gloss, pink hair, a broken red fingernail. Is her husband a cheater? Do you think for a second this man was in bed with a woman and never laid a glove on her? No, I don't believe that. He says he's been faithful. You seem very smug about this whole thing. But she says he's full of it. You say you need to know you've been violated. You already know you just don't want to own it. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by, Dr. Phil. I try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. In five, four. I am not giving up on you. Go, Dr. Phil. My guest today calls herself a detective. She spends a lot of time gathering evidence against her husband by looking for clues and taking photos of anything out of the ordinary. Here's a photo she took in her husband's car of a suspicious broken red fingernail. Here's another mysterious pink hair she claims she also found in his car. In this photo, she suspects it's a footprint on the back of the driver's seat, possibly from another woman. In fact, she's taken 72 photos of things that she finds questionable. She says her husband is a liar, and she's desperate to prove it. Ed and I have been married now for 20 years. Ed's told me he's thought about other women, sexted, chatted with different women throughout our marriage. I never had sex with any of them that I communicated with or touched their bodies. Even though Ed's given me a list of women that he's cheated with, I've never been able to prove that Ed has physically cheated on me. I've taken pictures of his clothes, looked in his phone at messages, his work emails, and I have looked in his car. Sarah spends a lot of time looking for evidence of affairs. This is a photo of Ed's car with smeared glittered lip gloss, pink hair, I don't have pink hair, a broken red fingernail, I don't have fingernails, a footprint on the back of a seat, a footprint on headrest, and if I had to guess, he was having sex in his car. I took two of Ed's laptop computers into a forensics computer store. I found out that Ed would send meeting invites to fellow co-workers and put secret messages within the invite. It was white text, and so you had to highlight the text and put a color to it so you could see it. These are pictures of Ed's shirts, and that is the back of the upper neck where it looks like more footprints in here. I've given her every ounce of truth that I can many times over. She's still very much unsatisfied. I've tried as hard as possible to find evidence against Ed, and it doesn't matter. He always denies it. It just makes me feel like I'm going crazy. Well, Sarah says Ed's given her plenty of reasons to feel crazy. Ed's been lying to me the entire time I've known him, but I didn't find out that he was lying to me until 2003. I found an email that Ed had sent to another woman that said, if we're gonna do this, we need to be careful. When I questioned Ed about the email, he said it was just a joke. Shortly after the email, Sarah had gone through my phone bill. She recognized that there was a phone number on there that was on there at all hours of the day and repeatedly. When I called the number, out of curiosity, a woman answered. He said it was a woman at work that he'd been talking to and he knew it was inappropriate and he'd stop. We did stop communicating, but I had a work relationship that required us to still have emails and that conversation unfortunately became more and more friendly again and within a few weeks we were communicating inappropriately. This woman that Ed cheated with is a disgusting pig. She crashed our vacation in Disneyland. He stayed in the hotel room with her overnight, had phone sex with her, and swears he never touched her body parts anywhere or ever kissed her. We lied in bed together, talked intimately to one another. They just laid there looking to each other's eyes and talking. It's insane. It's not possible. The emotional affair lasted two and a half years. 12 years later, I believe Ed's still in a relationship with this woman. Okay, uh, let me start this out by asking you what you want the focus to be while you're here. He and I, what do we do? Is it savable? Is it not savable? Do I know everything? I don't feel like I do. Um, and I don't know what to do with that. I don't know how to Okay, well, I'll let you ask that. a million questions. Ed, what, what do you want to focus on while you're here? General interest is how to rebuild trust and communicate. I think that's really what 
we've lost all capability how to do. Or do you think you're trustworthy? I believe so. Uh, so you don't think that she has any reason at this point, maybe in the past, because you said in the past you hadn't always been forthcoming That's with her, right. but you think now that she has no reason to not trust you at all? That's correct. Is this what y'all want to talk about? Whether or not you can trust him or whether you can't? Because I, I know, know one of the things you've said yeah. to my team, yeah. who has worked really hard to try and get this prepared for me to, to focus on what you guys want to, mm -hmm. is that you didn't like the focus. You, you didn't like what we were asking questions about. So just, just hit the erase right. button on all that. You're totally no. in control. We'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. You just tell me, ask me questions and I'll answer them. We'll do whatever you want to talk about. No, I, it's not that I didn't like the focus. Oh, actually, that is what you said, because I have it right here written down. That is what you said. So, but it that's is. okay. It is, but... We'll, we'll just hit the erase sense. button on right. that. We'll talk about what you want to talk about now. Truth. Telling, I don't think he's telling the truth. And I think I have huge trust issues. He's not the nicest person that he could be. He's pretty self-centered. I think that's why I said I didn't like the focus because we were just looking at one piece of the prongs. And what piece was that? It was the the sex addiction. The cheating and, and all? The, yeah, and it was like, okay, yeah. well, yeah, that is huge because trust okay. is a main thing, but. Yeah, well, we, we kind of got off on that tangent a little bit because I, I got emails from you here. Mm -hmm. Help, please. Mm -hmm. Family of four being devastated by sex addict lying husband. This one, desperate for help. My husband was diagnosed as a sex addict. He cheated. Desperate for help, please. Destroyed by lies and secret. My husband is a sex addict. He's been lying for 20 years. Still has not told me the truth. I'm pleading for your assistance. I'm at the end of my rope. It's a losing battle. Urgent, desperately need help. Everyone suffering but my husband. He's a sex addict. He's cheated on me our entire marriage. So we kind of got true. off on that tangent. Right, right, because I feel like trust is But you see why we, that's the Absolutely. one prong. That's what you wrote about. Right. I wanted it to be the bigger picture, but I understand that okay, so you have Okay, so you wanted, okay. But Does I, that make sense? I no, mean, it doesn't, because okay. I kind of feel like I know what I'm doing and what I need to focus on. But as I've then said, do I've, exactly what you're no, I've said I'm turning it over to you. I'm no, going to let you decide what we talk about. So your first question is, do I think... He's trustworthy. Do I think that you're at a point where you can really believe him when he tells you that he is telling you the truth? Yeah. What are you pretending not to know? <sighs> Do you think for a second that this man was in bed with a woman for... <sighs> how long were you in bed with this woman? Overnight? Uh, two was, and a half, three hours. Two and a half, three hours, but it was during the night? It was during the night. Okay, and your story is you laid in bed with her. Were you all naked? No. Okay, but you laid in bed with her for three hours? Two and a half. All right. And never laid a glove on her? Towards the end, I did kiss her neck for ten seconds, and that was the end of the night. Okay. All right. No, I don't believe that. Okay. There's a million things I don't believe. Okay, so you, you don't believe that? No. I'm that. sorry, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> but I don't. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. I, I wasn't there. I don't know. You might as well have slept with her because you're going to get credit for it till the day you die. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 it's, you, you understand that she's never going to believe that. It wasn't my hesitation. But here's the point. You, one of your questions is, you want me to determine, help you determine whether or not he has cheated on you and been inappropriate, right? Yes, because I can tell you he has, okay. but he will deny it. Okay, but, but you... I'm sorry. You don't need him to tell you what you already know. Right, but this is where that whole, he argues that I'm crazy and that I'm damaged. And of course, I don't believe him because I'm traumatized. And so I needed you to come on here and say, maybe I am crazy. Maybe I am traumatized or maybe I'm not. And that's what I need from you. You're not crazy. You are traumatized. And you don't need him to tell you 
that that was not okay. Uh, well, we need to take a quick break. Up next, a key piece of evidence that could prove uh, Ed has been fishing for more than just compliments. We'll be right back. This is an ad I came across in 2012 that I can identify the body almost exactly as Ed. There's only been one ad that I've posted on Craigslist. I think I've seen about 10 ads on Craigslist that could be Ed. Recently, I had a big client say that they didn't want to rehire me because I was still married to Ed. They felt like the drama distracted me from my work. My client didn't think I could work for her again until I divorced Ed. I'm extremely embarrassed that my marriage is such a disaster that I can't even keep a job. Sarah believes her husband of 20 years lies to her about a lot of things, but she's recently had trouble proving it. Uh, has Ed stopped lying, or has he just learned how to be a better liar? That's one of her questions, which is a really good question. In 2012, Sarah says a family member brought something to her attention that well, she just said she couldn't ignore it. I've never taken any pictures of myself and sent them to anybody or posted them on any websites. Ed has sent me pictures of himself naked. So when I do see ads that look like him, that are naked pictures, I can look at the ones I already have and identify them. There's only been one ad that I've posted on Craigslist, and that was in 2008 or 2009. This is an ad I came across in 2012 that I can identify the body almost exactly as Ed. Typically, when Ed sends me a naked photo of himself, we'll put his hand on his stomach to hide moles. He will stand with his legs apart because he does have thicker upper thighs. And in this photo, that's exactly how this person is standing. I've certainly read, observed, seen it all, but that was the only ad that I've ever posted or replied to. I think I've seen about 10 ads on Craigslist that could be Ed. When I see ads like this that I think are Ed, it just makes me think that he'll never change. Okay, was that you in the picture? In the video? Oh, uh, the, the, no, absolutely not. You, you didn't take a picture and put it on Craigslist? Have you ever done that? Never. Uh-huh. Do you believe that? It's been, um, no. I've been going through this for so long, and I've been told I'm crazy or traumatized or whatever that I don't almost know what I believe myself. You're using this term uh, crazy, and I've not performed diagnostics on you. I've not gone through careful um, psychometric workup on you, but... Uh, I'm a pretty good judge of horse flesh, and I, I can tell you that, to use your term, you're not even almost crazy. Okay. Not even almost. You are obsessed with this. Mm -hmm. You are experiencing a lot of anxiety. You are experiencing depression. I think about the only thing right now that would make you happy is to learn that you're correct. You almost need Life to know together. that he is doing all of these things, which would be bad news at one level, but good news at another because it would mean that you aren't distorting reality so bad that you've spun off into the Netherlands. I'm always trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, because when I say you're obsessed, you know what I mean yeah. by that. I mean, because you're... Know. That you're, you're like collecting souvenirs now. It's yeah. like a receipt here yeah. and a condom wrapper and plane ticket mm -hmm. and all of that. Yeah. And y you have an explanation for each one of these things, right? And you've, you've given her an explanation for each one of these things. You've discussed them. Some of them are uh, not explanations of fact. They are, I don't know, I presume because they happened years and years ago. Certainly these receipts, they're mine, but this is a small sampling of everything um, we talked about. Was this yours? Yes. And, because that looks like it's pretty fresh. I would uh, challenge to find out if that serial number has any date stamp. I bet it's from 1991 era. Really, 91? 
<laughs> the, that's the last condoms I ever recall acquiring, yes. I just, I just, I've been married 38 years, so I hadn't seen one of those in a long time, so um, I don't know if they hold their luster um, uh, for that long, but the, the, what was the significance? Wh why did you pull these particular because, receipts? So the way this works is through our whole marriage, we've been married 20 years. Whenever I approached him with something that I thought was suspicious, I got in return, until you can prove something, quit bothering me. So that made me have to collect what you call souvenirs. This, this is April of right. 06. So in 2012, when I knew I was going to confront him, I went through everything because I knew if I confronted him, anything that existed, he would throw away. So in a book in our nightstand I opened in 2012, and in the pages were all these receipts and that condom in one page. But do you really expect him to remember what he spent $9.98 no, that, that wasn't the question. since on I, in April of That wasn't 06? the question. The question was, why is there a condom wrapper in there? And that was just all together. So I just took a picture of all this stuff. I can't approach him without proof. So there's proof of something. What is it? What is that proof of in your mind? Well, we've been married 20 years. We don't use condoms. So there's a used condom. What's it from? Okay, but why do you need him to tell you? Because I don't want to feel like I jumped to a conclusion and we have two kids and we've been married 20 years. Okay, and is because... it... I'm sorry. No. Is, is it okay if, if he was in bed in a hotel with no. this woman whether he had sex or he didn't? No. No. What difference does it make what he said? You can't have a marriage with somebody who's not going to tell me the truth, the whole truth. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Let's take a break. We've all heard about drug and gambling addictions, but what about sex addiction? Ed says he was diagnosed with it. Is this a real thing? We'll be right back. In 2012, my wife, Sarah, had done some discovery about sex addiction. She showed that to me, and I absolutely identified with it. What I think makes Ed a sex addict is his excessive viewing of porn, his inability to not flirt with other women, or to seek out other women. Our marriage counselor concluded that Ed was a sex addict, and surprisingly, I was happy. I felt like it was our opportunity to explain why our marriage sucked so bad. Well, is Ed a sex addict? Is that possible since he says he hasn't had sex with any woman besides his wife? Do you think he's a sex addict? By definition, definition, no, because he doesn't fit the definition. And what do you think? Do you think you have a sex addiction? I think uh, absolutely, yes, that I have a preoccupation and I have said to myself on many occasions that I want to stop with whatever that preoccupation is, and it's continued to my detriment. And you've been to treatment for this? Quite extensively. Yeah. You did inpatient and outpatient treatment for it? I thought you had, because one of the things you said is, I struggle with interrelation dynamics and being vulnerable and not isolating if I feel emotionally charged. Certainly. <laughs> and that bugs you. It just makes me laugh. That bugs you when he talks like that and uses words like no boundaries and self-gratifying and because you think it's rehab speak. I think it's, yeah, if I can talk the talk, I can do whatever I want. It's my excuse. It's like, oh, well, there's a reason I do it.
Swear I won't forget this Why do I regret this? In my mind reckless Thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless Anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless Betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open I hate being broken I feel like an ocean Filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion Rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking Reopen The scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go How did the treatment go for you? I would did say you that... you think it was successful? Absolutely. Uh, well, it, it's ongoing. I've never... Since I started two and a half, three years ago, I've experienced, learned a whole new way of thinking about myself and about relationships and about emotions and, and relationships. It's just not something that's ever been in my vernacular. It's actually been something that I've tried to stay away from, to not invest time or thought into. I just was happy-go-lucky. Mm -hmm. Experiencing what I've been through, what I've learned, has opened up all new colors in the spectrum for me. Right. How do you, how do you feel about your wife struggling with this pain and, and torment about whether or not she's in a dead-end street. Doesn't matter what you finish the sentence with, I feel terrible. Everything is a result of my past and I feel terrible about it all. Have you been truthful with her historically? No. About what's happened? Since the day that she confronted me, caught dead in a lie, that evening, I sat down in our back porch and I tried to recollect anything I could. And four months later, we went through the disclosure. And since that time, it's always been a matter of anything and everything I can recollect, full disclosure. We're talking 10, 15 years ago events sometimes. And those are, I don't want to say hard to remember, but the sequence of events sometimes and the milestones are all I remember. And, and so it hasn't been consistent. Not that it's changed, it's just it's changed. I can't remember what happened first, this or that. Like I said earlier, I can't remember if that hotel event was before, between, or following any of the conversations we had had about her. Mm -hmm. So that's a lie. 
Do you think he's still talking to her now? I think he could be, yeah. You still talking to this woman? Absolutely not. Well, Sarah and Ed aren't the only ones riding this relationship roller coaster. Um, we're going to talk to their oldest son when we come back. I filed for divorce from Ed in May of last year. I haven't gone through with the divorce because of our children, but both of my boys have been affected by my marriage to Ed. He's not a very good dad. When he is around, he ignores our children. I want Dr. Phil to get to the bottom of what is wrong at the core of our marriage so my kids have a better future. Well, Sarah and Ed admit the dysfunction and distrust in their marriage has taken over their lives. I mean, it's really taken over their lives, personally, professionally. But they say they're most concerned, of course, about the effect on their children. Here's what their 18-year-old son, Randy, has to say. I was about 15 when I first started seeing my parents fighting. I don't accept that you leave the house and don't tell anybody. I don't accept that you don't think you need the cop. I don't it's not considerate. I can remember one specific instance where I left to go get food and came back and my dad was gone and his wedding ring was flushed down the toilet and his phone was thrown in the pool. I was frustrated because there would be times where I'd be like upset, oh, my parents are getting a divorce, and then shortly after happy saying, oh, they're going to work it out, and then a couple months later, we're going to get a divorce, and then being upset, and it was just a big emotional roller coaster. What hurts me the most is that my parents are still together, and neither of them are happy. I wish my father had never cheated at all. Okay, Randy, uh, I just wanted to um, give you an opportunity to say what you wanted to say. Uh, here briefly, and then I'm gonna excuse you and speak to your parents, but, um, and I, I don't involve children, but you're now of age and a young man, and I wanted to hear from you and see what you had to say about this. This has affected the family, right? Yeah, this has affected uh, home relations for a while. I've seen it for a while, the time that I've been home, when I am home, and if it could get resolved, that would be like what we would wanna do. And you say you wish that your dad had never cheated. What makes you think he has? Um, just from what I've been told, like, in the past. By? By my mom when she talks to me about it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How does it come up where you talk to your son about that sort of thing? When we started doing the whole sex addiction, get recovery type thing, I, I didn't, because he is older, and if you are a sex addict, supposedly it's semi, I don't know if it's genetic or odds are your children will be. And so I wanted to talk to him about kind of what was going on because he's going to have relationships in his life and he's going to have to, you know, I want him to get married and have a happy life and be faithful and be happy and don't feel like he missed out on stuff. So I kind of told him a little bit about, you know, why you see me sad or crying. It's because, you know, this happened. He doesn't know one-tenth of any of this. That's why I was mm -hmm. a little concerned about that. Mm -hmm. But he does know about her because it went on for such a long period of time and it's such a big issue and all of this that he knows about her. And you get that this is between them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does affect you. You're collateral to it. But you get this is between the two of them. Yeah. This is way above your pay grade. Yeah, if I'm getting paid. It, it doesn't have anything to do... These two can get along and not get along. It won't change how much your dad loves you, how much your mother loves you. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with their relationships with you. It just has to do with how they negotiate and put together their definition of relationship between each other. Yeah. So what will it take for Sarah to believe Ed? Should she believe him? Should she trust him? Um, I'm going to tell these guys what I think's going on, what I think needs to happen, and how I think they got in the situation they're in right after the break. Look, I think the only thing that is going to give you peace is for him to tell you that the things you believe to be true are true. Anything short of that, you're not going to think he's telling you the truth. Well, and that's why he's offered, you know, to take a lie detector test and to do all these things. And I've been like, do I want the marriage that has to take the lie detector test? 
but you don't believe him. No. And, and there's nothing he can say. You say you want him to take a polygraph. What would you ask, what would you want to ask him on a polygraph? Have you ever had sexual contact with another woman since we've been married? And if he fails that, then I'm confirmed that I'm not crazy, and I can move on. Okay. But he won't take that polygraph. I'd absolutely take it, and you're absolutely wrong. But... Yeah, okay. So you have not had sexual contact with any woman other than your wife since the day you got married? 100% correct. Okay. There you go. Right. Do you think you have behaviors that are change-worthy? Certainly. Absolutely. Because yeah. you seem very smug and aloof about this whole thing, like you're just kind of tolerating the whole conversation. Because you don't seem very bought into her feelings about this at all. I'm absolutely bought in and invested. This has been three years of this. I understand what's going on. And um, I, I was just curious how you came to the interpretation that I'm being aloof. I haven't felt that I've been um, addressed very much. Um, <clears throat> floor's open, I'm just... I'm not asking to be addressed, we just haven't spoken much, so I'm, I'm, I'm listening, I've been I'm, listen I'm, I'm observing. The floor's been open for you to get in anytime you want in, I've, that's, that's what I mean. Your question is, do I have things that I can change? Absolutely. You know, there's a, there's a really old model that kind of describes this, the dynamic that goes on here. Mm -hmm. You get into these ego states, and... It's really interesting, you know, you, you see people get into, like, the parent state. You look at them physically, they can be angry and impatient body language, finger pointing, patronizing. Then, like the child, for example, you get a lot of tantrums, whining, shrugging, teasing, and then you get into a relationship pattern. A healthy thing in a marriage is for people to engage adult to adult. And that's where everybody's on the same level and they're talking. And that's not what's happening here because you're in a parent role here. Mm -hmm. You're holding him to account all the time. You're questioning him. You're tracking him as though he's a child. And so then he has almost no choice but to engage back in this way. And you have a, so you wind up with a parent-child relationship in a romantic situation in what should be an intimate relationship mm -hmm. that never works you say you need information to know whether or not you've been violated you already know you've been violated you just don't want to own it that's the piece that i'm stuck with is why would i trust somebody who lies to me nobody would trust somebody who lies to you you already know that he lies to you right right but he swears he doesn't lie to me but you already know that he does right Honestly, that's why I wanted to come here to have you look me in the face and say, you're okay. You're okay to think these things. You're not crazy. You're okay to think these things. You're not crazy. That's all I needed. Listen, I'm all about reunification of family, and but I, I can tell you, if she is going to forever not trust you, and, and you know in your heart that, look, I've screwed up in the past, but I'm not now. Right. If this is a life sentence, you ought to run. You ought to not walk. You ought to run. If it's a life sentence, is there's nothing you can ever do to vindicate yourself, then you no. ought to run. There's no, there's no certainty in life, right? I'm absolutely there. You say we got to break this cycle. I agree. Despite the parent-child relationship, there is a certain symbiotic need when you have that relationship. I can try and be the adult. We don't have a relationship then. I can't just leave my wife and family with the mess. 
that I started. How about he's it's never not tried up to deal with trust? Then if you it's need a to, life sentence, we can agree that, but I'm not leaving. I'm not going to walk away. Then you need to man up and plug in. Dude, I'm there. I need to man up and plug in. I, and I, I asked you before to define what that meant, and I still don't know, because if I'm not doing it, I need to know. Drop all of the buzzwords and all of the rehab speak and look your wife in the eye and say, what can I do today to make your life better? I ran this off in the ditch. I'm going to do what it takes to get it back on the road. And if I have intimacy issues, if I'm scared, then that's what I mean, man up. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get real and be there with you, for you, by your side. Five minutes ago, you told me to walk away from the life sentence. If, the, if this is a life sentence, if there the is truth, nothing you... Listen, she's told you it's not going to change for her. Let I me, told you I can't change the truth. Let me tell you, if there's nothing you can do, if she is never going to turn you loose then you should walk away and both of you start over. You know, you'll spend the rest of your life doing this? Absolutely not. You'll spend the rest see, of your life doing this? I don't this? want to spend another day doing this. I want to leave here and it'd be different. I don't ever want to feel like this again. Well, it's, it's, time, to, it's time to hit the reset button. And I went to. One but, way or the other. But it keeps just, it's like Groundhog's Day. It's just the same crap day after day and the same conversation and the same excuses and me didn't so, change it and i try, but i feel like i try and then i hit this wall and then i get depressed and i don't get out of bed that ain't about him that's about it's you. totally about me because i can't deal with it anymore you can you got to realize one thing you don't need him to be okay because you know what if this <laughs> doesn't work you'll be okay <sighs> If you, if, you, if you trust him and he jerks you around, you'll be okay. You got to know that, and then, you know, then you don't have to as worry. As long so as you're telling that. me I'm not crazy. Okay, I look just at don't want to be crazy. Look at me. Look at me. You're not crazy. Okay. You're annoying. <laughs> you're ready. Coming up, the woman who started smoking when she was 14 is now concerned her 14-year-old son will follow suit. Has her bad habit already rubbed off on him? We'll talk to her next. <laughs> time. My next guest, Tracy, started smoking when she was just 14 years old. Now she's 43, has a 14-year-old son, and is worried the same smoking pattern will happen with him. Yet she still continues to smoke up to a pack a day. I've been smoking pretty much my whole life. I started when I was 14 years old when I hung out with a headbanger crowd, and I thought it was cool, and I looked older. They all smoked. So here we are. My son's 14, and he is in a band. I see myself in him, and it scares me. I do worry about him picking up a cigarette and smoking it one day. I have felt peer pressure to smoke. Smoking is a huge deal in the band scene, so whether to just look cool or that your friends in the band are doing it too. If I wanted a cigarette, I could get it. After almost 30 years of smoking, now I'm desperately trying to quit. I do worry about heart disease and lung cancer. My biggest fear is not being around to watch Austin grow up, to not be a grandmother one day. I feel like I'm a good mother. I think the only major bad example that I do set is smoking. My mom is very, very afraid that I might start smoking at my age because that's the age that she started through peer pressure. I want my son to live a healthy life and I do not want smoking to be a part of his future. I don't want to see him go through what I'm going through now. Well, Tracy is here and her son Austin is in our audience. And also joining us is our good friend, Dr. Frida Lewis-Hall, Chief Medical Officer of Pfizer. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you all. So great glad to see you. Um, so listen, you're, you're, you're still smoking, but you said you would quit smoking uh, last week, right? After you took a trip. Yes, I went camping and I told everyone I was going to quit smoking after my camping trip. Okay. Uh, did you smoke right before the show? I did. Wow. So what's the deal? 
Well, I knew I was coming on the show to talk to you about quitting smoking, so. Yeah. And I needed a cigarette before I came on the show. Oh, no, that's not, that's not good. Now, there are some pretty startling statistics when it comes to smoking. Frida, fill us in here. So smoking, obviously, is just a huge health issue. In the United States, 480,000 people die of smoking-related illnesses per year. That's about one in five deaths being smoking related. Nine out of 10 adult smokers tried cigarettes first by age 18. And to carry it further, roughly about a third of young people who start to smoke regularly before adulthood will eventually die from a smoking related illness like lung cancer or heart disease. Now, you started at 14. Did you ever intend to become a regular smoker when you started? Not at all. When I started, I thought it was cool, and I looked grown up, and, and you know, I got addicted to it. And so here's the thing. Teens don't start smoking saying, oh, wow, OK, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm, I'm going all the way with it. No. They think that it can be casual. They, you know, it looks cool. Um, they're in. Um, their friends are doing it. So they smoke cigarettes or e-cigarettes. And they think, well, I can just quit whenever I want to. But here's some other startling statistics. Some research has shown us that within only days of starting casual smoking, teens can begin to show the signs of addiction. And further, some teens actually begin to show signs of dependence within one day of first inhaling. One day? One day. Oh, wow. Now, this is your son, right? Yes. OK, have you, have you smoked at all, Austin? No, I've been offered a cigarette before by my friends, but I've used my, I've used my best judgment and said no. Okay, so, all right. So, con congratulations on that. You haven't gotten into the peer pressure, which is a, a big deal. And, you know, look, the best way to prevent a teen from becoming a smoker is to prevent them from ever starting smoking. And as a mom, you're right to be concerned. I mean, you are, you're right to be concerned. You've seen firsthand the effects of having a parent who smokes combined with peer pressure and how it can influence a child in a negative way because you have started. been there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanna share something personal um, with you. Um, we have something in common in this situation. My mother was a lifelong smoker. She started when she was a teen. And she, like you, was determined that I would not smoke, and I did not. I do not, like him. Um, but she was so busy saving me that she did not save herself. Like me. <laughs> like you. My mother died the summer of my freshman year of medical school, suddenly of a stroke. And she had tried many times to quit, <clears throat> but it's hard. And so I would like to encourage you to keep trying to quit. It's not unusual. In fact, it's average that someone who successfully quits smoking takes six to nine tries before they finally succeed. I always felt that my mother was one or two tries from quitting. So I would like to encourage you to see your doctor and a specialist who can work on putting a quit plan together that's right for you, something that you could work <clears> with. <throat> and we know you already have support, yes. someone who really wants this to happen and will work with you. And of course, there are resources that are available. You can get started with some of the ones that we have on gethealthystayhealthy.com. But I really want you to not have Austin be me <clears throat> um, later without his mom doing all the things that you just said, no graduation from medical school, no marriage, no grandchildren, none, none of that. And you have a chance. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's never too late. And knowing yourself, do you think you'll cave? Would you do better if you had professional help? Yes, for sure. Because if, if, you, if you need professional help, I will get you professional help if you will it. do this. Because let me tell you, that boy wants and deserves his mother to be in his life all the way. Okay? I'd like to thank all of my guests today, especially Dr. Frida Lewis-Hall. For more information on today's show, you can visit drphil.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Awesome. Good job, buddy.